name is Brandon. I'm a native of Mobile, Alabama. If you can't hear it in my voice, uh, I'm assistant pastor at Calvary United Pentecostal Church. I'm an ordained minister in the United Pentecostal Church International, where David Bernard is our general superintendent. I am a member of Monotheism Mandate uh, with Bishop Hayes and a host of other oneness apologists. I have one wife. I'm the, well, better yet, should say I'm the husband of uh, one wife. I have one child. Uh, and I asked for another one, and my wife told me she's won this. Uh, so <laughs> I think she's ready to close shop. Uh, I am 34. I have uh, a bachelor's of business. I have a master's of business. I'm halfway through my DBA uh, with a focus in finance. I have uh, completed a foundational certificate in biblical studies from Purpose Institute, where I am also an instructor uh, in our multi-site uh, campus that we have. I've served in various ministries in my church, and I play the saxophone. My name is Albie, and I serve at Maranatha Bible Church. I'm a, <clears throat> the parking minister there. I um, <clears throat> love the people at my congregation. I've never gone to school for uh, theological studies. Never gone to school, dropped out of school, met the Lord in a jail cell in November of 2008. And ever since then, the rod of discipline has been on my back. So I thank the Lord for uh, where he's brought me. I'm a father to a pet, a chihuahua. She's three pounds. Her name is Chewy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, I study with a, a dear brother who fathered me in the scriptures. His name is Sam Shamoon. I love him very much brought me from milk to meat and uh, yeah so at, at this point i've always had a great desire for the true triune god seeing that the very heart of our salvation is who god is and i'm praying that the lord would use me as an instrument of light for his glorious kingdom and all i have in, in this world is the lord jesus and I'm just thankful for that for right now, you know, and I look forward to the day that I can meet him face to face and behold his majestic face and take a look at those scars that bought a maggot like me. Amen. Amen. So with that being said, I'm just going to reset the room here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending our debate today with Albie and Brandon Nero topic of discussion is who is the holy spirit here is the format we will have 20 a 20 minute opening for both then we will have a 15 minute rebuttal a 20 minute cross examination and a five minute close there will be a two minute warning for the time's sake uh we are not going to have a chat during this during this debate and there will also be a 15 second grace period to allow you to land your plane on any given statement so with that being said, I think we're we're good to, to get going. Uh, who would like to kick us off? I think I'll be the one kicking off. And I was just going to tell Abby, hey, Albie, hey, education doesn't mean anything. I, my grandfather had a seventh grade, and he was probably the greatest man I ever met. So if it means anything, I don't look at stuff like that. That's that's childish. But I, oh, I'll no, be going first. No, no, I, I don't. You know, the, the reason why I was, I was kidding around, the reason why I mentioned that, and, you know, a lot of people tell me as well, like, you know, you should go to school. At this point, it's too late. When I mean too late is when people look at me, I believe they'll see and be encouraged that they too, if they study and love the Lord and submit themselves to the Lord, can get to a level of... Uh, understanding in which we can divide the scriptures and you know attack heresies mm -hmm. together but yeah man so in other words acts 4 13 john 7 15. gotcha yeah well i am I, I could go first i think as if we as we have agreed and uh and jerry i don't know if you'll be keeping time but i'll be having it on my side i guess you can let me know when i can go all right i'll start the timer as soon as you begin speaking all righty and 
Again, I want to thank those who have come to listen and uh, my uh, colleague here, Albie, I thank him for contributing his time and skills to help us grow in this endeavor of understanding the things God has revealed to us in scripture. I want to make sure that the premise of my position today is that I, whereas there are some similarities between oneness and Unitarianism, uh, our belief in the unipersonal nature of God, we have some distinct differences that I do not want to uh, explore it in a uh, prejudicial way, but just to bring clarity. Uh, the one who most have called uh, historically, as one writer would say, as the shy sovereign, uh, we know him as the Holy Ghost, is none other than the one true spirit of God who has been active all throughout the Old Testament covenants to this present time and dispensation. As a oneness Pentecostal believer, I am going to affirm the position that this very self-same Holy Ghost that indwells believers in this present hour is none other than the God of all glory in creation who has revealed himself through Christ Jesus and manifested himself to us by giving us and filling us with the Holy Ghost. My argument will be built around a three-part uh, structure, no pun intended, to that structure will demonstrate that this before mentioned truth will be realized in premise one, the Holy Ghost is the one spirit. Premise two, the Father is the Holy Ghost. Premise three, the deity resident by incarnation in the man of Jesus Christ is that same Holy Ghost. Premise one, God is testified to be a spirit according to the witness of John uh, in uh, John the fourth chapter at the 24th verse. The scripture would read at the 21st verse, Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Notice who worship is being given to, not a triune being, not a being separate from God, but there is a, a clear picture that worship is being given to the Father. Verse 22, ye worship, ye know not what. We know, being the Jews, what we worship. Why? For salvation is of the Jews. Jesus affirms in a clear statement that the Jews had it right in who they worship. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why? For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him, not them, in spirit and in truth. What can we extract from this witness of scripture? One, that worship is directed to the Father. Two, that that worship that's directed to the Father is the truth that the Old Testament is built upon, sorry, two powers in heaven. Oh, and that worship that's given to this true God, who is our Father, is by nature a spirit. We understand this witness to be built even further by looking at 1 Corinthians 12 and 11, that we understand it testifies to the truth that God is one spirit. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit. Notice it's one spirit bringing multiple manifestation is given to every man to profit with all. The same spirit that is the one that gives and uh, regenerates believers is the one that gives us all things. Verse eight, verse eight rather, for to the one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by what spirit? The same spirit to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work of what? These manifestations by the self same sentient spirit. What is he doing? Dividing to every man severally as they will. No, 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 as he will. For as the body is one and have many members and all the members of the one body being many are how many bodies? One body. So also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles or Israelism, whether we be bound or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. What is interesting to note that if we are his body, which is the essence that persona 
signifies who he is, then what is the spirit of the body? By necessity, that spirit would have to be the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4 and 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called into how many hopes of your calling? One calling. 1 Corinthians 3.16, ye are the temple of God. The same writer would say in 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, the apostle had said, ye are also the building of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19, you should know that your body is the temple for the Holy Spirit who is in you. You have received the Spirit from God. Why am I quoting these scriptures? Because it demonstrates the timeless truth that the one true God, God of all the holy prophets. We can call him Holy Spirit. We can call him Holy Ghost. We can call him Spirit of God. But these titles all delineate the one personal relationship of who the Spirit is. If the Holy Spirit is simply God, one may ask, why is there a need for there to be separate terms? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The reason is that because it emphasizes a particular aspect of God, uh, his relationship to his omnipresence, to his omnipotence, to his power, and more importantly, and to the invisible nature of his spirit. Why? Because by nature, God is invisible unless he makes himself known to us by a conscientious effort of his will. When we speak of the Holy Spirit, we're reminding ourselves that God is by nature an invisible worker among humans and his ability to anoint, baptize, and fill and dwell in our lives are done past the ability of man to discern them. The term of Holy Spirit speaks of God's activity and his motion and his functions in the earth. And so as a one that's Pentecostal, when we refer to the Spirit of God, we are not referring to a secondary or a third uh, conscientious being who is uh, mentally or cognitively apart from the Father, but we are simply describing his actions and motions as who he is, such as in Genesis 1 and 2, when the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Premise number two, the Father is the Holy Ghost. The scripture brings us to this clear witness of scripture by making it clear in St. John 3 and 16, when the scripture makes it clear that the Father of Jesus Christ is the one true God. And Jesus referred to the Father as his own Father many times in John 5, 17 through 18. Some may say, well, what is the problem? Well, Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through verse 20, and Luke, the first chapter at verse 13, at verses 35, plainly reveals reveals that the Holy Ghost is the spirit of the Father, that this is the one that has caused the conception of Jesus Christ to come into reality. The reason why oneness Pentecostals reject the strict and unbiblical frameworks of what many call Orthodox Trinitarianism is because they will go counterintuitive to the revealed revelation of the word of God given to us. The spirit is given from the father as recorded in the words of our great God in Joel when he says in the second chapter verses 27 through 29, what did he promise? Thank you, Jesus. I will pour out my spirit upon how many flesh, all flesh, This spirit that will be poured out upon all, we should not confuse it to mean that those who were reading it believed that he was talking about a third or secondary person who is a personification of who he is. No, he said that he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We find that it will be that great apostle Peter who had the keys to the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4 and verses 16 through 18 that would apply this prophecy of the Lord God Almighty. That saying that this which you both hear, you see, you experience, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joe. The Bible also in the same chapter lets us know that that which is poured out is this which Jesus has poured out. And John truly baptized with water, praise the Lord. But there is one that comes who is mightier than I, who will baptize you in what? The Holy Ghost. We should understand that it is the feeling, the baptizing, the reception of the Spirit, all the same act. And we see in one instance, it's the Father, but in another instance, we have it as Jesus. Could it be that this one? 
one God of all eternity is revealed and manifested in the man Christ Jesus, thus being the place that he gives and anoints his saints for service. Since there is only one spirit, all these phrases must refer to the same being. The Holy Spirit is none other than Jehovah God and of none other than the Father. Further witnesses of this would be that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, according to Acts 2.24 and Ephesians 1, verses 17 through 20. But yet we find in Romans, the eighth chapter at the 11th verse, that yet the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. If we are to function in a strict Trinitarian category, why is it that we have the work of one person of the Godhead being attributed to the other? God the Father quickens and gives life to the dead. According to Romans, the fourth chapter at the seventh 17th verse. Oh, but the word of God doesn't stop there. It tells us that in Romans 8 and 11, the spirit will quicken and bring us back to life. We find that the spirit adopts us. Now, it is important to recognize the language of adoption because the one who adopts us is the one who takes us into himself and assumes parental responsibility. It is the spirit who adopts us, but we understand that it is in Romans 8, 15 through 16, that the one who adopts us is the spirit of our father in Ephesians the third chapter verses 14 through 16 bears witness of that because it is the spirit of our father that feels and indwells us we understand the father feels the hearts of all of his saints but in St. John 14 23 we see that it is the father that lives in us the Holy Ghost as we love to talk in Pentecost is the comforter the one who brings strength the one who brings ability the one who gives us the ability and power to go all the way. He is described in St. John 14, the 26th verse, according to the Greek, as the parakletos. Oh, but God the Father is the God of all comfort, according to the scripture of 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. God the Father comforts us. And what will you notice? That same word for parakletos or paraclete is uh, in reference to God the Father as a parakelo. Us is the church and he is the one who comforts us in tribulation. Uh, we find that it is the spirit that sanctifies in 1 Peter, the first chapter at verse number three. But there is a little bit more because Jude uh, tells us that it is the father who sanctifies us. Who gives inspiration to the Bible that we're reading? This is something that I believe we both can agree on, that the word of God is right. And despite who may say different, we can stand on it. Why? Because it is inspired from the very mind of God. Who says this? Second Timothy, the third chapter of the 16th verse declares all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. But we find second Peter, the first chapter of the 21st verse tells us that the Old Testament prophets were moved by the Holy Ghost. One portion of scripture would say that it was the spirit of Christ that moved them. Who inspired the prophets to write? Who anointed them for divine service? We find this idea even continued when it tells us that which person of the Godhead is our one who gives us the ability to be in our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of God, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Yet they are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I will go on to venture that this Holy Ghost who indwells us is not a, another person, that it is just another way to describe who is in us. Who gives us the word to say in times of great times of distress, which any person who has served God has had those experiences. According to Matthew 10, 20, the spirit of our father will give us words to say in times of persecution. But we find here in Mark, the 13th chapter at the 11th verse, uh, 11th verse, the Holy Ghost will do the giving of the words to say. From all of these previous witnesses in premise two, one thing can be ascertained that God is the God of all comfort, that he is not only the God who regenerates, but he is the God who sanctifies. He is not only the God who sanctifies, but he will be the God who glorifies. For the Bible declares that if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwell 
in you, the same spirit, the same spirit that dwelt in him, that dwells in us, which is the Holy Ghost. If he's in you, that he will quicken your motor body at the day of the rapture of the church. Premise number three, which will be my final premise in my introduction. The deity resident in the man of Jesus Christ is none other than the Holy Ghost, which we have already understood to be just simply the spirit of the Father. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of Jesus Christ, according to Philippians, the first chapter at the 19th verse. But Galatians 4 and 6 tells us that it is a spirit of the Son. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter at the 17th verse says of the one spirit, now the Lord is that spirit. We must ask ourselves, who is the Lord? Who is that spirit? The reason that the writer was writing this in Corinthians is because he was trying to get them to understand the necessity of turning to God and to turning to Jesus and that it is when they turn to Jesus that the veil will be lifted. And the writer leaves no doubt by making it clear to us that the one that they will turn to will be the Lord. And not only will it be the Lord, but the Lord is that spirit. I am no fan of the NIV because of its liberal leanings, but this is one area that I must say I like its wording. It says, now the Lord is the spirit. And one version would go on to say the Lord who is the spirit. In short, the spirit that is resident in the man Christ Jesus is none other than the Holy Ghost, which is the active spirit of our father. The spirit is the son is the Holy Spirit. Parallel verses to bring out this truth that we understand how the Spirit has revealed himself in the incarnation as the man Christ Jesus. We understand this further. The Spirit of Christ was in the prophets of old, according to 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11. But yet we know that it was the Holy Ghost that moved upon them uh, in 2 Peter 1, 21. Same author. Do you think he's trying to tell us that it was two authors or two persons of the Godhead who were moving to write? But we must be careful to not work anachronistically and to force the apostles and to force the prophets to bow their knees to the later conciliar thoughts of corrupted men to make them force or appear to be declaring an idea that was foreign to their mind. We understand that it is Jesus who will raise the believer from the dead, according to St. John 6 and 40, yet the spirit of the living God will quicken and give life. How many persons of the Godhead are going to bring us to eternal life? We must ask these questions. The spirit raised Christ from the dead, according to Romans 8, 9 through 11. Yet Jesus said that if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up, John the second chapter, verses 19 through 20. St. John 14, 16 says that the Father would send another comforter, namely the Holy Ghost. Yet in John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. We must ask ourselves, how did Jesus come to us? How did Jesus live in us? And how did Jesus fulfill his promise? If it was only for the time after his resurrection, that would only be good for 40 days. If it was only uh, for us to wait for his second coming, that means he hadn't come yet. But he promised that he would be that comforter. Jesus would go on to explain his wording and reason. And this is the danger of proof texting because it leads you to conclusions that are not biblical. Jesus said it very clearly of his only volition in verse 17, saying that the comforter was with the disciples already, but he would soon be in them. We must ask ourselves, who did they know? Who did they embrace? It was none other but Jesus himself. Uh, I'm going to jump a little bit further because I feel a few points going. Jesus explained this, and I'm sure this is going to come up in the cross-examination. Again, as I alluded to earlier, we understand the Holy Ghost is the promised pericolitos in John 14, 26. He is the comforter, but yet in 1 John 2 and 1, the pericolitos is Jesus. How many comforters or intercessors do we have? It's the same author. It's the same one who wrote them, but he's using the exact same Greek word to demonstrate what he is saying. The spirit is our intercessor, according to Romans 8, 26. Yet Jesus is our intercessor, according to Hebrews 7, 25. The Holy Ghost will give us the words to say in the time of persecution, according to Mark, the 13th chapter at the 11th birth. But Jesus said that he would do so, according to the witness of Luke 21, 15. What did he say? For I, for I, 
for I will give you the words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist and contradict. In conclusion, in Acts 16, verses 6 through 7, the RSV and the NIV both equate that this spirit that forbade the apostles to go into an area to do ministry, the KJV says the spirit. But the Bible tells us in more up-to-date version, I'm going to have to give the Calvinists a wave on this because the ESV got it right. They said the spirit of Jesus forbid us to come. And with that, I yield my time in Jesus' name.